truly an honor to be here with you guys. Let's go ahead and worship our Lord. Father, we are so grateful for who you are, for your protection and your provision in all things, God. You are so good. You will never fail us, Lord, and you never will. And so this morning, we remember that and we worship you.
community distant right now in proximity, we can still come together and worship God with one voice, as one body. So all together, let's sing this song. Let's sing all my music. And when I leave this Churches last. And uh, so we're making plans that when they finally do allow us to be inside, that uh, we will still stream live for those of you who need to stay home or stay protected. We, we didn't go into streaming uh, until this because I, I don't like people to stay home and make excuses and not come in because you need that fellowship and you need that hugging. but. This is something I guess we're going to transition into and we, when we get back to some type of normalcy. But uh, right now we're going to make the best of the situation. These guys are in engineering, they're throwing up these tents and stuff. It's pretty awesome to see the creativity of our team. They've done a wonderful job setting up every week and picking it down. That's awesome. And don't forget, coming up this Wednesday is New Mexico Praise. And so most of you have signed up for a portion, maybe a half hour, an hour, during Wednesday from noon to midnight to take that time to pray. And so I would hope that just a reminder is to take that time, pray for this nation, pray for this church, uh, pray for the work that, that's begun during this pandemic that many people are starting to question, many people are starting to, to ask questions and to seek the Lord, and that the Lord may be found, may He bless, may He use this time to bring a blessing to people. Um, there's just so many things going on. Hey, a little roadrunner coming through here. Mm -hmm. um, you never know when you're outside, right? Live. So, what we're going to do is we're going to go into Zechariah 8 today. Zechariah 8. We're going to bring uh, the Word of God and we're going to start with the Word of Prayer. Father, 
I thank you, Lord. I thank you that you are so good. Lord, we are so evil. We, we as a nation have, have turned from you. We've, we've sinned. We've done things, Father, that are unconscionable, almost unforgivable. But you are a God of grace. I pray that you would come in, that you would help us, Lord, to turn to you in this time, to trust in you, to reject our own plans, to tor turn towards righteousness. And Lord, that you would work in the midst of our hearts, Lord, using us as those vessels of righteousness, that we might have that ministry of reconciliation. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. A lot of things have changed during this pandemic. Social distancing, staying at home, different things that you're having to eat or trying to eat. Just want to let you know that, you know, I'm a vegetarian now. Well, not a strict vegetarian. I eat beef and chicken, some pork and some fish. But, I guess what it comes down to is I eat a little more arugula than I've ever had before. And the idea here is that I love to pick on vegetarians, right? Vegetarians, they have this idea that, oh man, if I have this, then I'm righteous somehow. They want all the benefits of meat, right, without the sacrifice. And so they pursue these things, and to try to get enough protein, you, you've got to fill up on beans. And, you know, they have an advantage over us, at least at a vegetarian's house at night, it's a very musical house. And, and they've got these ideas that we, we want to have, we, we want to condemn the use and, and, and eating of, of meat and animal products, but we want our food to resemble animal products. Our food has to look like meat, and so it, it, at you know Thanksgiving we got to come up with tofurkey. So it's it's not really turkey, but we want it to taste like it. And we take tofu and we shake it like turkey. And then although we don't like Jimmy Beans, we do have you know this um, sausage, this garden breakfast patty. It's made of, I don't know, seeds and something, right? And, and, and it's flavors like pork. And then you've got the idea of here's Burger King, and we got this meatless burger that's going to fool even the, the meat lovers, right? Because it tastes just like beef. What's the point? What's the point if you say, hey, I hate meat, I hate eating meat, but then everything that you do, it makes it seem like you desire to eat meat. There's an inward desire to eat meat, but you come just short of doing that. And then there's this righteous kind of vindication that we are better folk than other people because we don't eat meat. Now, if you're a vegetarian, man, I'm just, I'm just pulling your leg. But it leads into something that God was dealing with Israel. They had come back from exile. They hadn't built the temple quite yet. They're partway through it now as we're going through Zechariah. And what we begin to see is that God is asking them, Are you authentic? Do you really believe what I've been telling you? And, and so he's got to say, thus saith the Lord. You'll see it repeated numerous times because it's probably several messages coming together. But he's also making a statement. Why is he so repetitive? Thus saith the Lord, for the word of the Lord coming. Because they weren't acting on his word. They were stopping just short, having an outward showing of this. Remember the king in the last chapter saying, hey, should we continue in these kind of fast that we created? Well, you created them. God's saying, are you, were you really fasting for me? Should really for me? In this chapter, he concludes that idea, and he answers them in this. But there's also some, some hope in here. But he, the, the theme of this is to be authentic, to be the real thing. So Zachariah, yeah, he speaks on judgment, but he's not a one-string pony, one-string banjo. He, he also speaks of restitution. He also speaks of reinvention. He also speaks of the 
uh, restoration of Israel and of God's people. So we begin to see verses 1 through 5, Zechariah 8. It says, And again the word of the Lord of hosts came, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am zealous for Zion with a great zeal. With a great fervor I am zealous for her. Thus says the Lord, I will return to Zion and dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth, the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Says the Lord of hosts, old men and old women shall again sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each one with his staff in his hand because of great age. And the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in its streets. And so he's talking about, this chapter is talking about the restoration of, of Israel, but he's also going far ahead to the arrival of the great king and the ultimate restoration when God sets up his millennial kingdom, not just this return from exile. It's the zeal of the Lord. Now, in some translations, this is translated the jealousy of the Lord. But they get it right here in the zeal of the Lord because he's not jealous like some green-eyed monster, you know. What are you up to? Let me check your phone. Let me see what's going on. He's not, he's not that way. What he is, it, it's a different word that means passionate. He's passionate about you. He loves you. He has a zeal for you. He, he wants to be close to you. He wants the best for you. That's what somebody who loves someone else does. They're enthusiastic about that person. And so he says, one day, look, when we get returned, this is going to be called the Mount of the Lord. Because remember, in the Bible, when they were going into captivity, it says that the Lord's Spirit left the sanctuary. He says, I want you to build the sanctuary again. I want to live and dwell among you, even though the earth is his footstool and nothing can contain them, but it's symbolic of I want to be with you and be uh, alongside of you and I want that love relationship and someday it's going to be called that you're partially building it now but I want the whole thing I want truth and holiness, see how he begins to say these words sometimes we think God's just throwing these out there because they're kind of poetic, kind of God's like, I don't want a small book, you know, when they finally put the Bible together. I want to kind of get the word count up, so I'm going to throw in truth and holiness, and, you know, how many times can I do that? I want to, you know, double space and invent, and so I need this big volume of... He's saying it because that's something that's lacking. It's something that they weren't authentic in. It's something that a true relationship needs. You need holiness, and you need truth don't have that, you're not going to have a good relationship and it can't be blessed. And so what's the proof? What's, what's the end game that he's saying? He goes, here's the proof. You'll know that I've been working. That I brought you back out of captivity is that when we get to this place, you're most vulnerable. We've heard that a lot lately, right? Your aged, your most vulnerable will be protected. They'll be so protected that they're going to be out in the streets, just walking around, not worried about anything. Each one has their hurricane, because it's the best selling in the United States, right? Some of you know what I'm talking about. So they, they have their hurricane, and, their, and, and, and they can come and go as they please, because before, the aged and the young were vulnerable when they were going into captivity. Those were the first that were killed off. He says, now you're going to be in such safety that they're not going to be worried. They're not going to be hiding because they don't travel or move fast. They're not going to be sequestered or in isolation or social distancing. They're going to be around enjoying life. And the children, they're going to be playing in the streets, man. Now we kind of worry about that we hear playing in the streets. Of course, remember, they're streets. It's not like cars are zooming by. I remember playing in the streets growing up, though. I mean, I don't know if you ever did this, but I, I, I had one of those games that we played. Right at dusk, right before the people turned their lights on, they didn't have the auto lights back then. You actually had to pull a switch. 
right? To get your headlights to come on. So right at dusk, when it's just a little bit dim, a little bit dark, but not, not dark enough you can put on lights, we used to play steak tug of war. I don't know if you ever did that. You actually have to get two two ropes, right? And so you're holding ropes and each person, each group of kids get on each side of the street, like you've got the rope extending across the street. But there is no rope, there's just rope in your hand. And it has to be timed perfectly, right? You gotta be you gotta be good actors. So when one one side pulls on the rope, the other side you gotta be pulling forward, right? And and it has to be synchronous. So when a car is coming down the street, you start pretending you're having this tug of war and cars slam on the brakes because they think there's a rope across the street. And there's not. I mean, <laughs> We used to do that until one time this, this dad got out of the car. And most dads, or most people would get out of the car, they couldn't chase you down. We had this one dad get out of the car, and he must have been some kind of athlete, man. So we're, we're running all around the place, and he's chasing us around. That was the last time we played Tug of War. But he said, the kids are going to be playing in the streets, and this is the proof, this is the result that's going to happen. And we're going to see this stuff. This is a symbol for them. Look, I'm going to restore you, and, and they'll be peace. But this is just a sim, symbol, just just a type of when the, when the Christ really comes, when Jesus really comes in the millennial kingdom, that the peace there will be unreal. I mean, it's almost unbelievable. Revelation 21, 24 through 27 says, In the nations of those who are saved, shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth shall bring their glory and honor into it. And its gates shall not be shut by day, for there's there's no no night. There's no darkness. They will bring the glory of and honor of the nations into it. But they shall by no means, there will be no means, anything that defiles cause an abomination or a lie, but only the righteous. Only those written in the Lamb's book of life. In that day when the new city comes there, it's going to be beautiful, it's going to be safe, it's going to be full of love. And, and this is a type, and he's, he's trying to get them to understand and to believe this. Has the Lord said, do you believe it? Do you guys believe it? Can I get a testimony? All right. Because what's happening is, it says in the last days there's going to be scoffers. That in the, they're going to say, where is the return of the Lord? Where is the coming of the Lord? There's going to be those who promote a lie. Those who are promoting the Antichrist. Those who are promoting a world world government. Those who are promoting this kind of communal socialism that's going to go throughout the world where they, they think they can make everything fair and everything right. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But they're, they're setting the stage for this person who's going to come in, this authoritarian figure, this Antichrist. Second Thessalonians 2, 9 and 12 says this, But the coming of the lawless one is according to the working or the strategy, what he set up beforehand of Satan, with all power and signs and lies, lying wonders. And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth. Jesus is saying, and God is saying, hey, this is truth. This I want truth and holiness. They were deceived by a lie. They received and did receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. They rejected it even though it was blatantly true. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie and that they may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So the whole idea that a promise of peace doesn't come when you give up liberty. It doesn't come when you revel in unrighteousness. Peace doesn't come with this type of unlimited freedom, which means the freedom that they want, the freedom over their own bodies, the freedom over their own minds, really means we, we want to do evil, we want to do unrighteousness, we want to do that which may hurt another, but we want to be selfish. Freedom never comes that way. They want this kind of utopia where everything's fair 
everything's level and playing field is perfect. I gotta be truthful. You can never have a level playing field. It's impossible to make everything equal for everybody. People are always going to be of different ages. You're going to have different sexes. You're going to have different economic structure. Even if you try to do it the same, there's never going to be, at any time, everybody's bank account be exactly the same. It's impossible. But now this has turned into some type of push that there's got to be someone some method, some structure, some government that's going to make everything balance out and everything perfect. The, the problem with this mentality is for you to have power, for you to get in line, you've got to be someone who is less privileged, right? So then you've got to make up this kind of Caucasian privilege or white privilege. And then, then you've got to make up this, well, I'm more, I'm less privileged than you and I deserve more and I should have more power and more say because I'm more of a victim than you are. And so just, instead of just being a person of color, now, now you've got to be, well, let's one up that because I, I, I'm more of a victim than you because I'm also got a background, I, I have part of the uh, native indigenous people in me. So I'm not just a person of color. I've also got, I've also been a victim, which they haven't been, but I've also been a victim because hundreds of years before, maybe one of my ancestors was abused. I don't know, but I'm gonna claim that and be more of a victim. See, and the problem is, if, if you said that, here's what we try to do is to have a level playing field and that's what's good. The, the idea is that you're not trying to get a level playing field. What you're trying to do is give everybody an opportunity to rise to the height that they can, given what the playing field is. But if you're trying to say, here's the, here's the playing field, and, and I need to have more power, and I deserve more than other people, now you've got to put down those people who are up above, and you've got to continue to be. So let's just continue. So now I'm a person of color, now I'm an indigenous person, now I have to be female. Because uh, I'm more of a victim than males are, because it's a male-dominated society. But wait, there are other females in that category, so now I've got to add that I was victimized, or somehow I was uh, spurred, or somehow I have, uh, I'm a female, but I have uh, sexual um, disorders, or I have uh, sexual dys, uh, dysphoria that now you know I'm more of a victim because I don't know really what I am male or female or, or whatever I prefer I mean and that has to extend because you can't just have you know the two now you've got to go through there's literally hundreds of bio, not biological sexual classifications for people now Hundreds. So now I've got to add those up so that I'm, I'm more of a victim. I'm going to have more rights than enough. And you just keep adding it up all the way until you get to a, I'm also a practicing Muslim. Right? So now here's the problem with this they think that you gain power by villainizing, demonizing someone who, who's not, who is succeeding. So if you claim to be the victim, what happens when those victims now get aid or get help or start working hard or start doing things and they start succeeding so they are less and less and less of a victim? Because they, they get called names. They're turncoats. They're Uncle Tom's. Wait a minute. If you're a victim and you needed this help and you wanted this power and you wanted to be, why are you, why are you saying that that's so bad for this person? Because you begin to lose power. Because they begin to make something better on their situation. But I'm telling you, this mentality is leading to we have to have a type of society that 
these victims are looked after. And that you've got to make everything a level playing field. So the only way that happens is you have to have some type of extreme authoritarian government. Do you understand? So the extreme authoritarian government can then say, you know, these Christians, they're the ones standing in the way. These Christians are the ones who are putting you down because they say there are only two sexes, male and female. How dare they? We need to persecute these guys. They're a real problem in society. But you can't just say that. You're going to have the authority to do that. And so, man, we need somebody who has the world power and has power over armies and, and over police force and can enforce this maybe monetarily. Do you see where this is going? And this is not just in our nation. This is worldwide. And it's leading to this idea of people are going to give over their rights because they're, they're thinking that they're going to be brought up to some some social stature or some freedoms that they, they think that they've been denied. And then they want to have this freedom and unrighteousness. And let's persecute those anybody who, who would say no, but we need somebody who can actually kill them. And that's what the Antichrist is going to do. And so this world leader says they wouldn't love the truth that they might be set free, that they might receive this love. Instead, they turn to hatred and vilifying people and a leader who would act on their hatred. And so what did he say? Well, can God turn this around? Can God do something? Zechariah 6 through 8. Thus says the Lord God, the Lord God of hosts, if it is marvelous in the eyes of the remnant of the people in these days, will it also be marvelous in my eyes, says the Lord of hosts? Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will save my people from the land of the east and from the land of the west, and I will bring them back, and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and righteousness. Here's what he's saying, because he knows what's going in their minds. See, they had just see, seen economic devastation. They had just seen people lose their lives, lose their jobs, lose their homes, lose family members. Sound familiar? And he's saying, I brought you back, and you're building the temple, but you're kind of slowing down, and you're not, you're not, not authentic. Kind of like, we're doing this, but we really don't believe in it. Because is it a marvelous thing? Is it something that you think this is too hard for God? It, is this something that, that is not going to happen? I'm bringing people from the east and from the west. I'm bringing people from all over the world. See, there are three different times when God did this. He did this when they came back from exile. So they just witnessed the first time. After 70 AD, we, we begin to see that the, in the dispersion, Israel gets sent out, and 2,000 years later, in, in 1948, Israel becomes a nation again and brings them back in. But there's one more time when the Antichrist comes in and disperses them, that God's going to bring them back to the millennial reign or the thousand year reign of Christ. And each time, people are going to doubt, people are going to think, man, is God really returning? Is Jesus really returning to call us into the clouds? Is he really going to set up this... this is this all just a dream? And they're saying, is there anything too marvelous for me? Is there anything too hard? Because it doesn't seem possible by what you see sometimes. Remember Abraham and Sarah? Abraham and Sarah. Here they are. Promised this child. When's this child going to come? Took matters in their own hand because their faith began to wane. They didn't think what God was doing was such a marvelous thing. So you have Hagar. Then you smell. And so God comes to him. Here's Abraham, like 99 years old, right? Sarah's 80, 89. She, they're well past the time of having children. And so a precarnate visit, here's Jesus. He's talking with him. He says, hey, can you hear? I'm going to be there, and, and you're going to be having a child. And Sarah was in the tent. You know, she snickered. She started laughing. 
No, let me read it for you. It says, therefore, Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I have grown old, then shall I have this pleasure or this joy, my Lord also being old? Or, or Abraham, he's like a hundred, he's like a century, man. And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, um, not saying, shall I surely go and bear a child since I'm old? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I'll return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. We look at this world, we look at what's going on, we look at the corruption, we look at the evil, we look at the destruction. We see some glimmers of hope, we see God doing some work, but then we sometimes wonder, is this, is this all an illusion? Am I, am I living some kind of life? Is Jesus really returning? Yes, he is in the appointed time, not a second before, but not a second late. He's going to return. And God told the same thing to Jeremiah before they left. Jeremiah first says in, in chapter 32, Lord, is there anything too hard for you? But then his mind, it waned a little bit. And he had the fear. And then later on in the verses, the Lord said to Jeremiah, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? He will regather. He will bring them back. He will restore them. He will keep his word. And he doesn't lack the knowledge or the power to do it. So, so how should we react? Verses 9 through 13. Zechariah 8. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Let your hands be strong. You who have been hearing in these days, these words by the mouth of the prophets who spoke in the day of the foundation, the day the foundation was laid for the house of the Lord of hosts, that the temple might be built. For before these days, before this restoration, it was terrible. Before these days, there were no wages for, the, for man nor hire for the beast. There was no peace from the enemy for whatever, uh, whoever went out or came in. For I said, all men, everyone against his neighbor. But now, I will not treat the remnant of this people as in the former days, says the Lord of hosts. For the seed shall be prosperous, the vine shall give its fruit, the ground shall give her increase, and the heaven shall give their due. I will cause the remnant of this people to possess all these things. And it shall come to pass that just as you were a curse among the nations, O house of Judah and house of Israel. So I will save you, and you shall be a blessing. Do not fear, but let your hands be strong. So what does he say we need to do? Is it too marvelous? Is it too hard? Is your heart failing? Here's what he says, and it's a terminology that they would use when they're going into battle. Be strong. Be strong. Your knees start to shake. You start to get... Uh, feeling in the pit of your stomach, you start to worry, man, is this going to turn out all right? Am I going to survive? Is this it? And he's saying, get a backbone. Stand up. Be strong. The Lord is on your side. Even though all these evil things, you have chosen the right side. And he's telling them, in the former days when you couldn't even, you couldn't even get a job, you couldn't get hired, you couldn't even rent your donkey out for a day. You know, when they were hauling rocks around because nobody had any money. And this seemed ridiculous. They got it. He goes, but look at it now. Look how it's going up. If this is just a little bit and you're beginning to believe a little bit, he goes, until I put it all together for you. Have hope. Have faith. Be strong. Because he'll restore the temple. But before, they were in judgment. And this is the this is the problem here, because they came out of judgment, and they were starting to return to the Lord, but then it turned not to be authentic. It started waning. Their hearts started going back to the world, back to the old things, not remembering the Lord. In Deuteronomy twenty-eight thirty-seven, it says, "And you shall become an astonishment, a proverb, and a byword among the nations, where the Lord will drive you." But he'll restore them. And so he's trying to get them through this crossroad, this crossover. Micah 5 7. Same time this prophet is prophesying. He says, Then the remnant of Jacob shall be like 
shall be in the midst of many people like dew from the Lord, like showers in the grass, that tarry for no man, nor wait for the sons of men. He goes, hey, what are you going to be made like? You're going to be made like the field where the rain comes down and, and you know, rain falls on it. It's not even waiting for somebody to come over and dig a ditch or build irrigation. It's going, God's just going to do it. The blessing will come. But therefore, don't be afraid. He's saying maintain through the battle. But I want you to maintain with this urgency and with authenticity. A heart that's warm towards the Lord. A heart that's pouring out. Not going through the motions. A heart that's impacted. A heart that's not worried so much about things. Because God can restore those. They're being too hard for the Lord. But we're worried over relationships. We're worried over our life with the Lord. We're worried over other people. Righteousness and holiness have now come in. Are we sure? He continues, verses 14 through 17. For thus says the Lord of hosts, just as I determined to punish you, when your fathers provoked me in their wrath, says the Lord of hosts, and I would not relent, they prayed, and I said, no, your punishment's coming. So again, in these last days, I am determined to do good to Jerusalem and to the house of Judah, and do not fear. These are the things you shall do. Here's what I wanted. What are you supposed to be doing? Build the temple? No, here's what he says. Speak to each man the truth to his neighbor. Give judgment in your gates. Like, don't, don't take bribes. Don't, don't pervert justice. For truth, justice, and peace. Let none of you think evil in your heart against your neighbor. Don't, don't hate your neighbor. Don't, don't let people divide you over hatred. And so you begin to hate other people when you're not united peoples. Not the United States. We're now being torn apart because we're taught to hate one another. Do not love a false oath. For those are things that I hate, says the Lord. What does God say? I want you to do what's right. Truth, justice, and mercy. What is he talking about? Speak to each man the truth to his neighbor. Tell it like it is. Be an authentic. Not changing things, not giving misinformation for self gain, self glorification, for their promoting their agenda. Just get the information out. Man, this is a perversion today. There's, you can't trust anybody or any news source anymore. It's hard to trust anyone. He says, render sound judgment, dispensing justice. If any, if there is any a time in America, I mean, we don't know 200 years of history exactly what happened, but right now, there is no justice. We have people in government, politicians, other people who are taking advantage of people, who are hurting people, who are doing things, and it seems like no one gets indicted. No one pays a price. God says, these things make me angry. And it's, it's something he says, don't do that. Because evil comes because of that. Corruption comes because of that. So he says, keep your hearts pure. Stop this vindictiveness, this anger against your neighbor. This was the same type of attitude when Jesus was going on. Remember the Pharisees came and said, hey, you need to fast, you need to do this, you need to wash your hands, you need to do all this. And Jesus is like, this is not offended. You wash your hands, oh, I'm godly. He goes, it's not washing your hands that make you godly. Because you, you can eat whatever you want. It's not what goes into your body that makes you unrighteous because it's not clean. He goes, what comes out of the body is because what's in the heart. Murder, adultery, lies. These are the things that, that you need to change. Not the cleaning of the outer vessel, the cleaning of the inner vessel. Because God's not going to force it. We have to choose to do that. And he says, don't love a false oath. Promising things. Going back on them. You know, having a hand out and then pulling it away. Is this 
This is not a new message. Look at Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. It says, These six things the Lord hates, yet seven are an abomination to him. This proud, arrogant, attitude and look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift to run into evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among the brethren. That's our headlines every day in America. Oh my gosh. How, how, how are we escaping this? Politicians, educators, they sow this discord, racism, hatred among people who weren't that way. Verses 18 through 23, Zechariah 8 says, Then the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, The fast of the fourth month, the fast of the fifth, the fast of the seventh, and the fast of the tenth shall be joy and gladness and cheerful feasts for the house of Judah. Therefore, love, truth, and peace. You see a theme going on here? Thus the Lord of hosts Thus says the Lord of hosts, People shall yet come, inhabitants of many cities. The inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, Let us continue to go and pray before the Lord. Join us as we're headed towards Jerusalem. And seek the Lord of hosts. I myself will go also. This many people, peoples, and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, In those days ten men from every language of the nations shall grasp the hem of the sleeve of the garment of a Jewish man, saying, Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. God will turn this misery into delight. I think you're seeing here kind of a transition, not just for what he's talking about Israel building this little temple. He's throwing it forward, right? So the arrival of Jesus Christ to this new uh, restoration to the millennial kingdom. And we begin to see this as a clear picture of when Christ returns and it's a message of joy. So he's answering the questions from the last chapter. As these people came back and they go, are we going to continue in the self-imposed fast during the fifth month and the tenth month? And God just sends a word through Zechariah. Not only the tenth month, but all your fasts. All of them. You're going to stop them all. We would stop them all? Yeah. Because there's no longer anything to be fasting over. No longer is there going to be something that you're mourning over. Because when the bridegroom comes, you don't need that. The Pharisees again, and the kingdom, they said, you know, the disciples of John and us, they fast. How come you're not fasting? Jesus looked at him and he goes, you know, when the bridegroom's there, nobody fasts. When the bridegroom, when you're having a wedding, you take one day out of the wedding because you have seven days for a wedding feast, right? You take one of those days and nobody eats or drinks and you mourn. No, you don't want to start off a wedding that way. Could you imagine? We're going to we're gonna have this time of wedding. These couples are coming together. Now let's be really sad. We'll talk like Eeyore, right? How are you doing? Okay. You know? No! It, it's, he's saying at this time, like this again, going to the millennium, I can't, man, I love going to Zechariah because I can't wait for this time. Who are these people grabbing a hold of? Hey, let's go and go into there and let's let's see the Lord and, and let's learn of the Lord and let's be taught about the Lord. Who's going to be doing that? You and I. We're for, that's part of our description and, and we're kings and priests in the new coming age and we're going to be there teaching people about Jesus. Telling people, you may not remember this, we remember. We remember these days. We remember His grace. We remember these things. And Israel will return. Isaiah 2, 3 says this. Many people shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So you see this not just in Zechariah, you see it in Amos, you see it in Micah, you see it in Zephaniah, you also see it in Ezekiel, you see it in Isaiah, you see it in a number of places because God keeps bringing this back up. This is what he's zealous about. He can't wait for that day also. 
and peace and righteousness and people are coming. He can't wait to depart with him. He can't wait to give out love. He can't wait for the joy. He can't wait for the feast and the festivals. He can't wait for the fasting and mourning and pain and hurt to go away. He can't wait to wipe away your tears. Because he's good, because he's life, because he wants us to walk in joy. But that doesn't come unless we get the message, and the message is walk in authenticity. Walk in goodness. Walk in righteousness. Walk in love. Don't walk in this idea that everything has to be done for you and everything has to be fair. Fairness starts with you. Do right. Do the other people right. Stop hating. Stop calling names. Acting in love. Yes, there needs to be certain exhortation. Yes, there needs to be certain um, truth and there needs to be justice and judgment. But only after love has been tried, only after reconciliation has happened. And so the idea is that if you go down this path, you go to a, it's a self-destructive path that seems like freedom, but it'll narrow and narrow and narrow until nobody has true freedom where everybody's hating everybody else because everybody tries to up one up one another in their victimization to get power. And it'll never work. Because you can never have a level playing field in victimization. But when you're acting in love, building one another up, trusting that God's going to do work and that God can work in extraordinary circumstances and even in those who are impoverished and those who call upon His name, he could do a marvelous thing. And so if you haven't trusted him, if, you, if you've been far away, you can return to him. And if you've never come to him, if you, if this truth is like, man, it's piercing my heart. It's coming in. It makes sense. And I want that. And I want that hope. And I want that joy. And I want that feasting. I don't want this mourning anymore. I don't want to live in, in discouragement. Then all you have to do is trust Jesus Christ. So if you're in the car today, or you're listening, or you're watching on YouTube, and, and, and we want to say hi to Cross Fellowship Red River as they're joining us this morning. God bless you guys up there in Taos, Red River, Cuesta, all those areas up there. We love you guys. If you're watching for the first time or you've never done this, just repeat this prayer because you'll enter into that kingdom. You'll walk in authenticity and holiness. And the prayer is just simply this. Dear Lord Jesus, please forgive me for my sins. Help me to walk in truth and in righteousness. So I trust you as my overseer. I trust you as my Lord. And make me your child. And let me dwell with you forever. Amen and amen. If you've done that, contact us. If you're trusting in Him, trust wholeheartedly and be strong. Be strong, America. Be strong, Christians. Be strong. We don't back down. We be strong. We are strong in Him and in His love. It's so awesome to see you guys. If you can hang out, hang out. I'm going to come around. Kathy and I will come around and say hi if you need to be, if you understand. We're going to have one more song, and I want to I want to thank this team coming up. Our, our worship team has been so awesome. Here they are. She's, she's doing like a, a month, and they're up here. They're serving. They've made this choice. These, these are strong Christians, man. These are people who love the Lord, and I, I love seeing this. They inspire me. So you guys inspire me. God bless you.